Welcome to the Birth Abroad podcast. My name is Megan Jennings, and I'm honored to host mothers who have come here to share their overseas childbirth stories. From fertility journeys to postpartum and beyond, this podcast is meant to hold space for women all over the world to share their unique experiences with the challenge of becoming a mother away from one's home country. Let's get in today's episode. Hey everybody and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Megan and I'm going to be sharing my second birth story today. I will just give a brief intro. I am an American. I live in Sweden with my husband Yuan and our three-year-old daughter and our now nine-month-old son. I guess I'll just pick up where I left off the first time. My husband and I talked about when we would like to start trying to conceive for our second child. Our plan has always been to only have two kids but I am maybe a little bit on the older side. I had my daughter when I was 32, and then, um, so I was 34 when we started trying to conceive for our son. We figured, you know, we're in our mid-30s, let's just get the baby-making years just over and done with, you know. So we decided that we were going to start trying in April of 2018, but I had been tracking my cycles, I'd been like taking my basal body temperature and taking like ovulation predictor test strip things each month and just trying to get in touch with my cycle again. And so I had gotten a positive ovulation test strip in January of 2018 and one thing led to another. My husband said, let's try this cycle and so we tried. And then I got a little antsy And instead of taking a pregnancy test, if I had missed my period, I decided to take one a couple days early and I got a very faint line on this test strip. And it was so faint that I decided to wait several hours and test again. I was using just those cheap Amazon wand faux tests, but I registered another very faint line on that second test as well. Before I had a chance to test again or even wait for my like missed period to come, my cycle began early the next day. So I will never actually truly know if I was pregnant and just had a very early chemical pregnancy that cycle or not. At the time, it didn't concern me at all. I didn't think anything of it. I just counted it as a fluke and maybe I was just seeing things on those test strips. I had thrown them away. So, you know, going forward, my husband and I did not try to conceive in February of 2018, but we decided what the heck, let's just start trying in March. So we tried in March, we gave it an honest go And again, I um, took some early pregnancy tests. A couple days later, I tested again and they were positive. They were still faint lines, but they were darker than the, the line I had in January. So I had assumed I had a good pregnancy, but I had been a member of the TTC community on Facebook and YouTube for a little while at that point. Just, I was, you know, trying to educate myself to try to make uh, this process easy for me. (laughs) And so I'd seen women do line progressions, which is where you take a pregnancy test every day and you wanna see your line get darker, meaning that your HCG levels are rising, which theoretically means you've got a healthy pregnancy. So I had been taking pregnancy tests every morning and I wasn't seeing my line get darker the way it should have. So I was already a little bit concerned. But I got a positive digital pregnancy test on Easter Sunday, and that should have been comforting to me, but I couldn't stop taking these daily tests, and I took them for about a week, and eventually I stopped taking them once my lines disappeared. So... I will say I saw it coming. I knew I was going to have an early miscarriage, what they call a chemical pregnancy. But like the worst part was my, I started to bleed on April Fool's Day. Okay. So like that was just so poetically cruel because it just sucked and it hurt. It was really painful. And I just, it was like heavy bleeding for only a five week loss. I was surprised about that. And now I bring into recollection what did actually happen in January. So with a real, like with a, with a definite chemical pregnancy in March, I now convinced myself that whatever happened in January, it was a loss. So now I'm thinking to myself, I've had two back-to-back miscarriages. And while I was not devastated, I mean, it really like we had only tried two cycles. It's not like we had been trying for years or months or whatever. I was genuinely scared that 
I was going to have issues trying to conceive. I was really worried and I was all alone. I like with with the January pregnancy, we didn't tell anyone because it was over before we knew it. But with this March pregnancy, my husband was so excited that he called everyone. Like he called his mom, he told his sister, like he told the whole family on Easter when we had that positive digital. And so like we'd already let the cat out the bag that we were trying. And like I had all of these relatives that I wasn't like super, super close with, you know, they kind of like knew my business. And then we had to tell them we had this loss and I was just so outside of my comfort zone. I really wish I hadn't told anyone. And at the same time, I really wish I had my mo- my own mom there with me, but I hadn't told her about anything. I, I guess I kind of didn't want to tell anyone until I felt a little more confident in the pregnancy. But now that I had miscarried once, if not twice, I really just wish I had my own mom and my own sister here with me that, you know, they could hug me and I could share my stories with them and just get physical, like in-person comfort. And I didn't have that. So that that was really hard emotionally. Um, We had, I wanted to skip the next month, which would have been April, um, just because I wasn't, I don't know, I just wanted to give my body a hot minute to recover before we like jumped into trying to conceive again. But I got this really strange sense that I was going to have like a good quality ovulation cycle in April. I was, you know, taking my OPKs and I was doing my basal body temperature and I just had this sense about me that this would be a good month to try no matter what. So we did decide to try in April and sure enough, we got pregnant again. So I immediately called my midwives here in Sweden and I said, look it, I just told them straight up that I had two early losses. I didn't want to get into the conversation of like, maybe I I had a loss or maybe I didn't in January. I just told them, look it, I've had two early losses. I'm pregnant again. Can I please come in and get some blood work done? Can you just check to make sure my thyroid is good? Because I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, by the way. So, um, you know, can you just check to make sure my thyroid levels are okay? Can you check to make sure my progesterone is okay? And can you please take a beta to make sure my HCG levels are rising? And I asked for these things because I had been a member, again, of these TTC communities online for a while now. And this is what all the girls get done in the US. You know, like, it just seems like something that everybody always does. And not only do they all do it, but it's just sort of this normal part of the early pregnancy procedure. You call your doctor, you tell them you have a positive pregnancy test, they bring you in for a blood draw, and then in two more days you go in and you give your blood again to make sure that your HCG levels have doubled, and then they schedule an ultrasound for six weeks. Like, this is just, this is what it seems like everyone in the U.S. does. I had expected the same thing here in Sweden. So I called the midwives, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, we don't do any of those blood tests. Like, if you have more than three losses, then, you know, we can consider getting your progesterone tested, but the whole HCG thing you know, it's not done here. If you do want to do it, you'd probably have to go to a specialty lab in the city far away. And, you know, like the hospitals don't even really do it for people and blah, blah, blah. So basically she told me that I would need to miscarry a third time before they'd even be willing to test me for anything unless I wanted to go private. And even then it wouldn't be a guarantee. Now, in retrospect, I've come to learn that there is a lot of um, doctors in the U.S. and Canada and like pretty much everywhere that has that three loss standard where you have to lose three pregnancies before they're willing to like give you any specialized help. So that's not anything weird that I've observed. But it did really stink that I was fresh off the heels of a loss and now like here we go again, you know, and it was just a tough pill to swallow. I was so anxious. I was borderline obsessive in this third pregnancy. I was taking pregnancy tests every morning. And I know some people say you shouldn't do that because, you know, it's just feeding into your anxiety. But for me, it brought me comfort because it was the only way I was able to check in on my baby and be like, hey, you know, knock, knock, knock. Are you still with me? Um, Because I don't want to lose you by surprise. I'm just going to sit around here and be a ball of nerves. 
one way or the other. So that is a very long-winded preface to leading into um, my pregnancy and birth story. So the pregnancy actually ended up being successful. And one really special thing that um, I got to do was when I called my midwives to tell them, look it, I'm, I'm officially pregnant again. Can I come in and get tested? They told me no to the progesterone and the HCG blood draw. But they did tell me that I was welcome to come in for um, a test of my thyroid. So they said, come on in, we'll check to make sure you're within range and we can establish a baseline. So I went in at four, no, I was four weeks and two days pregnant. And I went in to get my thyroid tested. And my midwife told me that she was actually the one who talked to me when I originally called. And she said that um, she thought it would be good for my peace of mind to get an early ultrasound just to see that the baby is there and it's healthy and whatnot. And I was so happy. I was not going to say no to that. So she scheduled um, an early ultrasound for seven weeks. I think I was going to be seven weeks. And so that is really like not a common thing to have happen here. And, and I didn't even ask for it. So I feel very, very thankful that that opportunity was given to me. So we went in at seven weeks, we saw the heartbeat, everything was healthy, everything was on track. And my husband and I went out to lunch and we celebrated and it was just so beautiful. I felt like at that point at seven weeks, I could finally celebrate my pregnancy and sort of put the miscarriage thing behind me. I had a very easy pregnancy. Again, pregnancy, I love being pregnant. I'm one of those really annoying people who <laughs> just loves being pregnant. I did not have any of the first trimester issues that I did have with my daughter. With my daughter, I had um, really, really bad fatigue and some food aversions, and I ended up um, needing thyroid medication and such. My thyroid did not go out on me this second pregnancy. Um, I had like mild hangover feelings for a few weeks. And I also dealt with a little bit of antenatal depression, which worried me because I had dealt with postnatal depression with my daughter. So that sort of put up a red flag for me so much so that I decided to schedule some um, therapy sessions during my pregnancy just so that I had established a line of communication in case things got a little wacky with my moods. But the antenatal depression disappeared after the 11th week of pregnancy and I never had a problem with it afterward. I had a ton of energy and a great second trimester and for all intents and purposes, I had a really easy and great third trimester. The only thing I will say was that I dealt with Braxton Hicks throughout my entire pregnancy the entire thing. Like I started feeling Braxton Hicks contractions when I was like 16, 17 weeks along. I was told that usually when it's before 20 weeks, it's due to dehydration. So I tried to like hydrate more, but I just legitimately dealt with Braxton Hicks throughout my entire pregnancy. Also a little hiccup at 16 weeks, I had a bleed and it was sort of like on and off for a couple days. And so I decided to go into the hospital because I was freaking out and they did a transvaginal ultrasound and found that I had a low-lying placenta. I don't know the details, but she said I had two centimeters of coverage and that was the cause of the bleeding, but she didn't tell me to like modify my life at all. She didn't tell me I had to stop working out or bed resting or whatever. Like she was just like, yeah, just don't be an idiot, basically is what she told me, the ultrasound tech at the hospital. So, at my anatomy scan, they checked my placenta positioning again, and it was still low, um, but not too bad. The ultrasound tech told me really not to worry about it, but of course I was <laughs> spazzing out and thinking like, oh my God, I'm going to need to get a cesarean. <laughs> so I went in for another ultrasound at, I think, 28 weeks, and by then my placenta had moved, so it was no longer an issue. So that was mostly my pregnancy that was like mostly the only issue I had. But when I was 38 weeks pregnant, I came down with the worst chest cold I've ever had. And it was so bad that I literally thought my abdominal muscles were tearing apart and I thought I was breaking my ribs. I My coughing was so painful we went to the hospital because I could not bear 
the coughing anymore. So they gave me some breathing treatments and they prescribed me a narcotic cough syrup, which didn't actually help, to be honest. It just sort of made me loopy and I don't know, I didn't like it at all, but I took it for a couple nights. The only thing that seemed to help was to melt tiger balm into boiling water and then to breathe in the steam. So it was like menthol steam. Breathing that in always soothed my lungs and it settled my coughing fits and it was wonderful. But I was in a bad shape for those last weeks of my pregnancy. My due date was set for New Year's Eve and my daughter was born on her due date. I didn't assume I was going to have another due date baby, but I did know that I did not want to have my baby in 2018. If it was up to me, I really would have wanted my son to be born in January of 2019 instead of December of 2018 because he would have just been that much bigger and that much older relative to his peers and maybe it would have given him a little bit of an advantage in school that I didn't have. So I was really, really, really wanting to have a 2019 baby. On top of that, I really wanted my son to be born on New Year's Day. If I'm going to have a baby, like at that time of the year, I could not think of a better birthday to have than New Year's Day. When like everyone is having parties and there's fireworks and, you know, it's always a time to celebrate. And I don't know, I just thought it would be a really special day to give birth. So with all of that said... I had this horrible, horrible cold, and I cannot believe I didn't cough until my water broke. It is shocking to me that my water didn't break for how hard and how frequently I was coughing. I was so sick and so exhausted that I was terrified that I was going to go into labor while I'm sick and not have the energy to give birth and not have the energy to handle a newborn baby while I'm recovering from this cold and stuff. So I went on to maternity leave a little bit early. I got to 39 weeks and I literally did not get out of bed. I just slept and I rested and I ate and I slept some more. I think it was 39 weeks even, or maybe 39 weeks in one day, I started to have prodromal labor at night. I would start getting contraction-like pains every night, but they wouldn't get any closer together than like 8 to 10 minutes apart. They never felt any worse than just bad period cramps, um, and then I, you know, they would go away by the time I would go to sleep. Like sometimes I would have one or two that would wake me up, but in the morning I would no longer have these painful contractions, just Braxton Hicks. And I wasn't in any hurry to speed up labor because like I said, I really wanted to have a 2019 baby. So I just took it easy and did the opposite of what most women probably would have done, which was I, I did everything I could to stall labor. But when I got to my due date, New Year's Eve, it was like this special, special moment. And <clears throat> I decided like around lunchtime that if I went into labor by lunchtime on my due date, the chances are that I probably wouldn't give birth until 2019. So at lunchtime, I went to the gym and I did an hour of cardio. I did like some incline speed walking and then I did some Stairmaster work. And then I did like all of these yoga poses and pelvis opening stretches and everything like that and I did some like meditation and whatever and then I came home and I wasn't feeling anything abnormal. I, I hadn't like lost my mucus plug and I, I wasn't feeling like any crazy Braxton Hicks and then I started getting a little antsy like oh man what if I go like really over my due date? I really want to have this New Year's Eve baby like how am I going to get this going? Um, we had plans to go to my husband's sister's house so that our daughter could go play with her cousins. But I was feeling really antisocial and our house was a mess. So I told my husband to just take our daughter and I was going to stay home and clean. So I wrote down in my journal that it was like 1, one thirty that they left. And I cleaned from like 1 or one thirty all the way till 6.30 in the evening. I did like five hours straight. I scrubbed the floors. I vacuumed. I mopped. I was on my hands and knees. I was squatting all over the place, like picking everything up. I moved our couch at 40 weeks pregnant. I moved our entire couch to like vacuum and sweep under there. And I cleaned out the refrigerator and blah, blah, blah. So 
I fi- I thought to myself, you know, if anything is going to put me into labor, it's going to be this. If I don't go into labor tonight, then it wasn't meant to be. So around eight o'clock, my prodromal labor started up again. And I thought to myself that maybe this is my last opportunity to get labor really going to hopefully have this baby in the new year. So we put our baby, our, our daughter to sleep and my husband had some reading to do. So he went and, and did some reading and I sat myself on my birthing ball in the kitchen. I was listening to a birth hour podcast episode. Ironically, it was the host's episode where she actually talked about using clary sage oil to help induce her labor and there I was sitting in my kitchen with my oil diffuser and my clary sage oil so I um, was bouncing on my ball throughout these prodromal labor contractions and I was eating some pineapple like with the core included because they say that there's an enzyme in pineapple that can like start contractions whatever I was drinking a giant cup of red raspberry leaf tea. I had like my six dates, these date fruits that you're supposed to eat each day um, at the end of pregnancy to help your cervix ripen. So I had those. I think I even swallowed an evening primrose oil pill. (laughs) And I'm like breathing in this clary sage oil in my oil diffuser. I like have everything going, right? And I decided after listening to this podcast, uh, the birth hour podcast, the host had said she had also taken some clary sage oil and she had diluted it in some olive oil and she had rubbed it on her ankles. So I'm like, ah, you know, what the heck? I'm going to do this too. (laughs) So I, so I did it and I put it on my ankles. I don't quite remember the timeline now, but I think it was like around nine o'clock at night. I decided to start timing my contractions because they were starting to happen in what felt like a rhythmic pattern and they seemed to be lasting for a certain period of time. So I started timing and they were like, I think they were like seven to 10 minutes apart and they were lasting, you know, about 40 seconds long. So I timed them for an hour and they were slowly getting closer together. And then like, I don't know, another hour passed and they were getting closer and closer together and they were getting like noticeably more painful. So it was around 11 p.m. that my husband had finished his reading and I had gone into the bedroom with my birthing ball and I was sort of like sitting on my birthing ball and I was leaning over the bed and I was kind of like, you know, I was having some pretty bad back pain now with these contractions. And my husband and I were looking at each other and we're kind of like, is this it? is this it? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if this is it. I've been having prodromal labor for eight days now. I don't, I don't know if I'm just having prodromal labor again or not, but I can say these are coming consistently at a pattern that they had never done before. We weren't really sure what to do. We were just watching a documentary on YouTube. I saw my husband was getting pretty tired and I figured if this was labor starting, I had a long road ahead of me to begin with. So I went and took a shower and actually took my phone in with me and I was timing contractions in there because I had read and heard that if it's not real labor, if you take a bath or a hot shower or something, contractions should space out or stop, but they didn't. And I distinctly recall that at this point when I was taking a shower, I was um, having contractions that were five minutes apart and all the pain was in my back. Like I'd feel Braxton Hicks type tightening and some discomfort, like period cramp discomfort in my abdomen. But for all intents and purposes, the pain was all in my back. And that really worried me because I had been afraid for a while that my baby was posterior. He hadn't been throughout my entire pregnancy until the very end. He started corkscrewing in my pelvis. Like those last few weeks of my pregnancy were crazy because my bump would be high and then it would be super low and then it would be super high and then it would be super low. And I could I could map where he was based off of where I was feeling his kicks and he was going crazy. He was just spinning in circles. Like he was always head down, but he was like either facing my stomach and then he was facing my hip and then he was facing my back and then he was facing my other hip and he was just going round and round and round. And I couldn't seem to get him to just stay still. And with all this pain in my back, I was pretty convinced that I was 
having back labor and that he was in a bad position. So I was already like worried about that. And I'm having these contractions and, you know, we decide after my shower, we really need to get some rest. Either this is going to happen or it's not. Let's try to get some sleep. So we lay in bed. My husband falls asleep immediately. And I notice pretty soon that my contractions have now spaced out to like nine or 10 minutes apart. And I was so depressed because I really, really had thought that labor had started. And now it was looking like it was just this false alarm again. But when I did get a contraction, it was super painful, like more painful than even when I was contracting regularly before. So much so that I had to curl into the fetal position with each contraction. And I actually had a contraction while curled up in the fetal position when the new year rang in because I could hear fireworks going off. (laughs) And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this is how I'm ringing in the new year. But I did make it to 2019. So that was like good news. So it gets to be about one o'clock in the morning and I realize I can't sleep. I'm in too much pain and I'm too excited and everything like that. So I go out into the living room and I called the hospital and I told them, look, I'm having these really painful contractions. I had been timing them for like an hour, hour and a half after getting out of bed and, and they had gotten to be about three, two to four minutes apart. And the pain was all in my back. So I asked them, what do I do? They're really close together. They're lasting, you know, 45 to 50 seconds. Sometimes they're lasting a minute. They're very painful. The pain is all in my back. But when I lay down, they had spaced out to like nine to 10 minutes apart. So what do I do? And she told me, well, this is your second baby. Do you feel like you're in active labor? And I was like, no. I don't feel like I am. I feel like the baby is still really high up. Um, I'm not having any pain like in my, you know, like lower pelvis. I don't know what's going on. So she told me to take two paracetamol and to just rest for an hour and see what happens. So we did that and things were just progressing. Like they were just really painful contractions. The pain was in my back. And I told my husband, look it, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm very dilated, but let's just go to the hospital. We got admitted at like around 3 a.m. And I remember the midwife on duty that night asking me if I felt any pressure like in my bum. And I knew what she was asking because, I mean, I was having some painful contractions and they were frequent. And I think she thought that maybe I was going to be delivering soon. And I told her, no, it still felt like the baby was really high up. So she had me lay on my back and she checked me and she goes, yep. She goes, you're only like two or three centimeters dilated. And I was like, oh my God, this is horrible. Like, how am I going to get through this, right? So, because I had had a plan all along that I wanted to have a drug-free birth. I wanted to have a natural labor this time without an epidural. I really, 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 really wanted to do that. So she suggested to me to get a morphine shot and just rest and see if the rest would help relax my body into dilating better. So she gave me an hour. She came back like 4, 4.30 and asked me then what I wanted to do. I asked her if she could check me. She said I was still 2 to 3 centimeters dilated, but I was 100% effaced. Um, and so I said, all right, let's just do the morphine because I am so tired. I'm so tired and I've got a long road ahead of me. So she gave me the morphine shot and my husband and I were able to sleep for about two hours. It was such a lovely moment. Like I just felt so in love with my husband and we laid there and just spooned on the hospital bed and napped. And I had a a TENS machine that I had them bring me, which was amazing for the back labor. And I had also, um, they had given me a hot water pack to put on my back, which my husband was pressing on my back. And I just, you know, we laid on our sides and I had the TENS machine and the hot water pack and the morphine and I was able to get two really good hours of rest. And then there was a shift change. So the new midwife came in and checked me and she said I was a four, but I was really stretchy. So she stretched me to a six and I was so happy in that moment. I'm like, oh my God, I'm six centimeters. This is fantastic. I've got this in the bag. So she asked me if I want to go in the tub. I said, yes. So I went into the labor pool and again, like all the pain was in my back and I really wanted to try to do anything to get my baby into a better position. So what I found helpful was I was on my hands and knees in the tub. And so like my belly was in the water, but my back wasn't. 
And anytime I had a contraction, either my midwife or my husband would take the like shower handle um, attached to the tub and they would spray hot water on my back. That was so nice. And then what I would do is I would put my lips into the water and I would blow gently like bubbles or blow air into the water. And there was something about the combination of like the hot water on my back and the breathing slowly like out my mouth and feeling the bubbles like pop up on my face that was very therapeutic. And I just kind of surrendered to the contractions. I focused very hard on making sure I relaxed every single muscle I had into the contraction. And then we were, I was in the, the tub for like a couple hours. And in that time, they had only like sparsely checked the baby's heart tones. Um, after my contractions, I had not had any kind of like heart strip done on the baby or contraction strip. And they wanted to get me out and get like a, a, a consistent read on the baby's heart for a minute. So I got out of the tub. I don't actually know what time it was at this point. It was probably like, I don't know, 9 or 10 a.m. And so they took me out and it was maybe like a three meter walk from the tub to the bed. And it was in just that short space that I realized just how cripplingly exhausted I was. I was so exhausted that I knew that there was no way I was going to get back to that tub. I really wanted to go back, but I just, there was no way I was going to make it back. And also coming out of the water, the contractions just were, you know, 20 times worse than they were inside the water. My midwife, she checked me and she told me, okay, unfortunately, you're still at a six. And it had been a couple hours now and I was getting some serious contractions in the water and I was doing such a good job of relaxing into them and trying to open my pelvis up on my hands and knees and, you know, swaying in the water and everything like that. And I, at that moment, sort of felt like maybe I was in a little bit of trouble because I was not dilating properly. I was obviously having back labor. Things were not adding up too great um, in my favor. So I had written in my birth plan that I did not want them to even so much as recommend uh, an epidural because I really wanted to try to do it on my own. So my midwife told me, she's like, we can do a couple things. She goes, we can do sterile water injections, which is where they um, shoot sterile water, um, just like sort of under your skin uh, in the small of your back. And supposedly it's supposed to be just like so, so painful that it will disrupt the pain signals to your brain that you're having with your contractions. And supposedly it's supposed to give you like, you know, an hour or so of relief. But I had already heard stories about that and I did not want to put myself in that kind of pain. So I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm good. And she goes, okay, well then we could also break your waters. But I was a little worried about breaking my waters too soon because I didn't want to end up on the clock and end up, you know, like if I wasn't progressing properly, needing any other kind of interventions. So I'm like, uh, can we just hold off for a minute? So she said, yeah. So she left and my husband and I were in the room together just laboring and my back labor was so, so horrendous that my 200 pound husband was putting all of his weight into my back via his elbow, just like pressing into the small of my back with each of my contractions. And that was the only way I could get through these. Like the Lustgas uh, nitrous oxide stuff did not help at all. It just made me delirious. Um, the only thing that helped was to just silently suffer through the contractions and have my husband put a ton of um, counter pressure on my back. So we did that for a while and then my midwife came in and I'm like, yeah, I just can't do this anymore. Let's, let's go ahead and, and, and do the water breaking because I'm exhausted. I'm not going to make it, you know, we, I'm not going to make it much longer. So she broke my waters and it got really crazy after that. I remember getting my first contraction post water breakage and it was like 13,000 times worse <laughs> than the contractions I was having before. It took my breath away. And I remember looking up 
with just this wild, feral look in my eyes and immediately looked at my midwife and said, all, all I could manage to say was spinal, spinal, spinal. And I was like whispering it. I was, I was in such a place of indescribable pain. I hate to say that, but let's just call it what it is, right? Um, that I couldn't even, I couldn't even vocalize. And my, of course, my midwife didn't understand what I was saying. So my husband sort of looks at her and he's like, I think she wants the epidural. And so my midwife was like, well, you know, okay, but are you sure? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so she goes, okay, well, the anesthesiologist on um, staff today requires um, that we have a intravenous line put in before he will even come into the room. Um, to administer the, the the spinal. So I'm like, I don't care, you know, put it in my head. I'm thinking, put the needle in my eye if you have to, I don't care. So I, I was like, fine, it's fine. And so she like fumbles around and looks for some needles and stuff. And then I have my next contraction. Um, these contractions are coming like what? Every three to five minutes? So, you know, it's only been a couple minutes. I get my next, my second contraction post-water breakage. And at this point, I realize I'm in trouble because the pressure I feel in my whole pelvic floor is so intense that I sort of spontaneously decided to try to Kegel and I couldn't. I felt like I could not contract my pelvic floor. It felt like there was an obstruction. It felt like something was in the way that would not let me actually like do a Kegel. And I think to myself in that moment, oh my God, is that the head? Like, is that, is that the head coming? And I sort of instinctively knew that it was, but I also couldn't believe it because just like five or six minutes ago, I was only at a six and I had been only at a six for a couple hours now. So she's trying to like put the IV line in. I only have one good vein in my arm and unfortunately she overshot it and she pierced the vein, which meant she had to find another vein. And all the while, you know, she's sticking me and all I can think of is, oh my God, how many tens of contractions do I need to survive before I'm going to get relief? She needs to get the line and then she needs to go and get the anesthesiologist. Then he needs to come and then he needs to like actually administer the drug. And then I need to wait for it to kick in and I am free freaking out in my head because this was so far beyond how I thought it was going to feel. And I just really, truly didn't think I was going to survive. I did not know how I was going to make it through this experience. Um, so as she is fumbling around, she gets the line put in and then she says to me, are you sure you want me to go get the anesthesiologist? And I said, yes. And I think I might have actually even pushed her, <laughs> which I feel so bad saying. And I hope, I hope I didn't. I hope I'm just making it up in my head, but I'm pretty sure I pushed her away um, and said, go, go get the anesthesiologist. So she leaves and not, not even a minute after she left, I had my third contraction post water breakage. And that's when I felt for sure the head enter the birth canal. And I had to wait for the contraction to peak out because the the pain was so intense, but once it sort of like peaked out and, and was coming down, I, I looked to my husband and I just, the only thing I could say was the head, the head, the head. And then finally I told him, go get the midwife. The baby's coming, go get the midwife. And so I think my eyes were closed because I don't remember looking around or, or seeing anything at this point, but I do remember my husband like running out the door he told me after the fact that he met the midwife very, very shortly outside of the room and she had sort of this calm look in her eyes and this sort of like smirk on her face. And he said that she said, hmm, I had a feeling it was going to happen quickly after her water broke. So she comes in and rolls me over and she looks at me and says, with just this calm voice, she goes, you're doing this on your own. You are ready to push. And I looked at her with this crazy person look on my face. I just know it. And I told her, I said to her, lie to me, lie to me and tell me the needle man is coming. <laughs> I feel like such an idiot. And so she laughs at me. And like, I, I think I remember saying like, don't laugh. It's not funny. <laughs> 
I sort of entered what I like to call the abusive phase of my labor where I, you know, the things I said are just the things I said. And I feel a little bit guilty because I had envisioned this like beautiful, empowering birth scenario. And instead what I got was just this wild, crazy version of Megan who like was swearing at everyone pretty much. So I wrote in my birth plan that I did not want anyone to coach me through pushing because I just wanted to ease my baby out. I did not want to suffer any of the tears that I did with my daughter, which I had detailed in my first birth story. So I um, did not want anyone to coach me unless it was absolutely necessary. So I only pushed when I had the urge to push. And let me tell you guys, I had the urge to push. It felt like... The same sensation of when like you're vomiting and you cannot control it, you are just heaving and heaving and heaving. That's what it felt like, except it was like out the other end of my body. You know, when that contraction came, I could not help but to push. But I did have a couple contractions where that urge never came. And so I just did nothing. I just rode the contraction and rested afterward. But I sort of misunderstood what happened at the end. When I started to crown, like, I don't know, the details are a little fuzzy, but I, my midwife told me at one point, she goes, okay, for this next contraction, I only want you to breathe breathe through the contraction, do not push. And I thought that I was only just crowning and I thought I was tearing. Um, What in reality was happening was I had already crowned and his head was already coming out um, and she just wanted me to gently go through it. But instead, you know, I, I just panicked and I felt the ring of fire pain like toward my, like the top part of my lady area, like not where my perineum is, which is where I had my worst tear with my daughter. So I was afraid that I was tearing upward. And I remember looking at my husband and God help him. um, I must have terrified him. I looked at him and I, I, I said, I'm tearing. I know it. I can feel it. And it was so scary. I wish someone had just told me, no, you're not tearing. Shut up, crazy lady. But they just kind of kept doing their job peacefully. And all of a sudden the head was out and I felt that sweet relief of like pressure and pain. And then with the next contraction, I did push. And this time I remember actually having to put some back into pushing with my daughter. She just like launched out. But this time I remember like really having to push. And I remember feeling the midwives kind of like jostling my baby and, you know, like easing him out. And, and then he was born and it felt like it went like a heartbeat for me. It felt like it went so quickly, but I did end up pushing for just under an hour, which was twice as long as I did with my daughter, which was the way I wanted it because I did not want to tear. And he was born. According to my husband, he was actually crying before he even came out fully. And they like lifted him up and they were doing something with him between my legs. I don't know why they didn't just lift him up and put him on my chest immediately. It kind of worried me. But they threw him on my chest and um, he started crying. He lifted his head. It was crazy. They did the delayed cord clamping and everything was fine, except that I started to feel some really, really bad pain in my bum, which I thought was a tear. And it kind of ruined that immediate postpartum experience because I was feeling a lot of pain actually down there. So much so that I told the midwife, please, can I get a shot of like lidocaine or whatever? So she gave me some shots. She checked me down there and she said that I only had like a very mild graze on my perineum and that was it. But that I did have some hemorrhoids, (laughs) which I'm not going to lie. I actually struggled with them through my pregnancy because I was on these horrible iron pills. So I have no doubt that I had them pretty bad with pushing because I'd already had them with pregnancy and they took me like a month to heal from. It was really bad, but she gave me some lidocaine shots and, and, and that, and that fixed it. So that was that. It was a beautiful experience. And after the fact, I was so thankful that I didn't get my epidural. I'm so thankful I got to go through this natural birthing experience. It was crazy, but beautiful. And 
I forgot to mention that during my prenatal care, one thing I told my midwife that I wanted was I wanted an extended stay in the hospital afterward because I wanted all the access to breastfeeding help. And I wanted to have my baby weighed more frequently because I did not want to run into the feeding problems I did with my daughter um, because that obviously affected me really negatively. So I got approved to have five to six days in the like postnatal ward, Bia Bia they call it here, like the patient hotel. And thank God I did because sure enough, my son had a horrible latch. My nipples were cracked and bleeding by like 24 hours after his birth. And I started my pumping journey pretty much like uh, what is it, 36 hours after he was born. And unfortunately, nursing did not work for me. I tried, but I had low milk supply issues. I ended up switching to exclusive pumping so that I could be sure of how much I was feeding my son. And then I would supplement as necessary. It actually took me four entire months to get my milk supply up high enough to be able to feed him full time. But I did do it. Um, So if you listen to my first birth story and how I talked about all my breastfeeding woes, it actually worked out perfectly fine in the end. And I am now nine months postpartum and I'm still exclusively pumping. And it's been a very rewarding, albeit difficult journey. Um, I feel like I should just do a separate episode in general on what exclusive pumping is like in a foreign country because no one here understands exclusive pumping. It's like you either breastfeed or you formula feed. But anyway, I got my extra days in the postnatal care unit. Um, I was able to get access to lactation consultants and realized that I was going to have some issues with breastfeeding and it really helped get my son fed and get me on track to a healthy breastfeeding experience. Um, So I'm really, really thankful for that. So all in all, I had such a beautiful experience with my second baby. I did end up developing postpartum depression again. It showed up the same way it did before. It showed up in ter- in the form of like just really bad rage and really bad anxiety. And so I went right on to the medication I took with my daughter's postpartum period and it fixed me right up. So I've been golden this time around. I have not had any issues and I have felt very supported by my healthcare team, but I think it's because I was able to advocate for myself. I knew what I needed help with. And honestly, it was only because of experience that I knew to ask for those things. But I had prepared myself this time for breastfeeding issues. I had I had supplements ready. I had my pump ready. I had my just I had my medication called in and ready in case I started to feel postpartum depression creep up on me. I had my therapist on speed dial in case I needed help with that. And it just made for a beautiful and positive postpartum experience. So even though my labor was a little crazy and and kind of sloppy at times, it really just was was uh, the experience of a lifetime. And I'm so grateful I got it. So that is my second birth story. I don't really have any more advice to give to expectant moms abroad beyond what I shared in my first birth story, but mainly it's just make sure you have your team built up around you before you give birth. Make sure you know where to go for lactation help. Honestly, like look into postpartum doulas. If I could have afforded one, I absolutely would have hired a postpartum doula to come and just be there with me to make sure I'm being fed, to help me troubleshoot emotional issues I was having or breastfeeding issues I was having or even just, you know, helping me throw the, you know, throw a load of laundry into the washing mach- washing machine or something like that. I think I really would have loved that. I, I feel like a postpartum doula would have been someone who could have helped me with every single issue that 
could have possibly arisen. One issue I did have was I had some pretty bad breakthrough bleeding at like four weeks postpartum where I had sort of overdone it and was passing some pretty big clots. I wasn't sure what to do so I kind of just put myself on bed rest but I think it would have been nice to have a postpartum specialist on call to sort of coach me through that. But otherwise, yeah, I, I found a lot of comfort in making sure I knew where to go for lactation help. I had established a good relationship with my midwife who told me I could reach out to her if I needed to. I had set up, you know, some extra days in postpartum care at the hospital. That all just made for this beautiful and seamless transition to second time motherhood. And that's my advice to mommies abroad. Just overly prepare. Oh my gosh. And one final word of advice, you guys, freezer meals. I made a month's worth of freezer meals during my pregnancy so that I did not have to think about cooking for myself or my family for an entire month. Um, definitely do that. But one word of advice, maybe try to make freezer meals without allergens like dairy in them because we were afraid that my son had a cow's milk protein intolerance. And so I had to cut out dairy and I wasn't able to eat like any of the freezer meals that I had made. Only my family got to eat them. So if you are a mom who has birthed abroad or you are seeking fertility treatments abroad or you have a postpartum journey or breastfeeding story, that happened in a foreign country that you want to share, please send me an email at thebirthabroadpodcast at gmail.com if you would like to be a guest and share your story. Otherwise, thanks for listening and I will bring you an episode next week.